ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and today we are spreading Death's Head Sphinx Moths. Um, I've been chatting in the comment section with Susan, which has been great. Um, <coughs> luckily, she didn't have any clothes moths at the, uh, the Sheep and Wool Festival, so that's pretty awesome. Um, these are some of the Death's Head moths that we spread in the last, in last week, but we are gonna start all brand new, and we're just gonna keep spreading these friends here. Now, um, I have a number that are relaxed, and... I threw a praying mantis in here because um, I found her passed away, alright, I didn't kill her, and I don't have very many really great praying mantis specimens, and I thought that it was awesome that she passed away in perfect condition in the parking lot right next to where I parked. I figured that it was meant to be. So, um, I guess my question is for you ladies and gentlemen, I was, I was just gonna pin her normally, but I do have a spreading board here. Would you like me to spread her wings that, so that her wings are open? I'll let you decide, because I think that that would also be a pretty cool display for educational purposes if I spread her like that. I have to get a different board. There are also boards behind the magic wall. So because I got a yay mantis from Susan, we're going to start with the praying mantis. Um, I'm going ahead and taking some of these pins out of the other board that don't need to be here because this is the board that this mantis is going to be on. Um, I don't want to spread the mantis on the same board that I spread the death's heads because they're not going to the same place. Cool. And this one has a narrower channel, so it'll be able to hold the legs pretty well. Alright, we got lots of light. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull my hair back just a little bit. Don't mind my hair. I spent um, all day working. I was looking at it. I was like, wow, but that's all right. You guys understand being outside all day and stuff. It's the end of my day. <laughs> Sorry. Um, happy day 15 of Invertober. Yes. Um, we've been having so much fun during Invertober. It is all right. Um, today we're going to be spreading Death's Head Sphinx Moths, but this guy is a Chinese mantis. This one is a Chinese mantis that I just put into the relaxation chamber, but I think it'll be pretty good. So I'll just go ahead and I will um, change it. I'll put it back when we go back to spreading death's heads. But um, our, I guess the question was, do you want, um, do you want me to spread the wings of this praying mantis? You know, I guess what we could do is we could spread one side. There are a good number of museum collections that do that. So, if I want to spread just one side of this praying mantis, normally, 
you pin on the right side of the thorax between the second and the third leg. So it would be right about here. But because you spread the right wing, um, when you plan on spreading the wing, what you do is you pin it on the left side so that you're pinning through the wing, but, uh, let's see, I want to make it, actually that was a pretty good shot. That was into the coxie. All right. So this is right about where I pinned my mantis. I pinned her over here on the left side and I'm gonna put her body into this channel so that she stays nice and ooh straight. Don't hold on, baby. I'm trying to get her in the center of this channel to hold her legs. There we go. So something about praying mantids is that when they're drying, they'll shift a lot. Um, it, I think it has to do with, it has something to do with their muscles in their bodies. Um, but there are also another one of those insects that will spin a lot on the pin. Praying mantids and dragonflies, both. You would think they're strong flyers and then they and they would have strong muscles to hold the, onto the pin. But they both will actually spin on the pin after you get them done. So I think I've got her pretty well centered in this channel. I've been trying to get her. Oh, that was much better. That was a much better shot. All right. So we've got her pretty well centered in this channel. I'm going to pull this leg in just a little bit. And um, one thing is with their antenna, a lot of times their antenna rays up away from their body. And where I think that is beautiful in real life, um, we need to make sure that the antenna stay flat with her body. Because if they are up like that, they are more likely to be... Um, <clears throat> to be uh, hit and broken in the drawer, especially if your mantis um, antenna are above the level, uh, are above like the height of the unit tray. So if you're thinking about how insects sit in a drawer, um, you don't want any of the insect parts to be above the level of the pin because the pin is essentially the top of the unit tray and the top of where they're protected. So if you imagine this pin um, right here in the center of our praying mantis, we don't want any of these legs or any of these body parts to be above the height of the pin, <clears throat> the height of the pin. Might be interesting, just have one side spread. Deal, that's what's happening. With mantids, the females will have a big swollen abdomen, right? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, female praying mantids will have a large, um, will generally have a fairly large abdomen. Um, now, the thing is that when um, praying mantids pass away, their abdomens will kind of turn black and kind of shrivel up a little bit. They don't do well. Their abdomens do not do well after they pass. Oh, come on, friend. Wow, that's beautiful. Does everyone see that before I cover it? Maybe I want it down a little bit more. Maybe like this? Um, they're with spreading mantids. There aren't really very many rules, at least I don't know the rules, I guess, is the better answer. I'm not sure if there are specific rules about mantids. I, if there are, I haven't heard of them. Um, 
So I'm just going to be spreading these two wings to where I think that they look mostly natural because the only reason I would be spreading these wings is to show off this characteristic that praying mantids actually have. Wow. Four wings. Look at how beautiful it is. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the same rules as a, um, as a butterfly or a moth. So I'm going to make this go out mostly straight, and then I'm going to lower the other side so that it matches. Let's see. Maybe what I'll do is I'll pin it this way. No, stay up. All right, so now that I've got that hind wing taken care of, what I'm going to do is actually remove this outside one because this piece is going over both, so I'm hoping that that'll mostly stay. And it's okay if it falls just a little bit because that's what we want it to do. So I'm going to take my forceps and just kind of bump this front wing. It should move pretty easily. Look at it. It's not. It's pretty tight there. There we go. That's more natural looking. Okay. like that too. Oh, thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. Oh, man. With mantids, all right, would you ever pin one with the pro leg extended so we can see it in all of its glory? I guess I could do that for you. Um, this specimen would then become very dangerous, but um, that is a good thing to have, especially it w for educational purposes, so you can show off those front legs. And I wouldn't mind a good picture of it myself. Whoa! So we're going to try. This specimen may be relaxed enough to do that. So what we're going to have to do to, um, to get that taken care of, I'm actually going to be... I need just an itty bitty pair of scissors. I don't know if I have a little pair of scissors. I only have a giant pair. I needed to get this paper away from my mantis so that I can lift it up if we're lifting the front up. There we go. Very good. So what we do here is I've already placed two pins on either side of the pronotum, and I'm going to take this pin underneath, and I'm going to try and lift her front part of her body. And we're going to see how relaxed she is. Because if she's relaxed enough, she will be able to just kind of pick this portion of her body up. All right. All right, so we've got two cross pins. We've got two cross pins underneath her. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna really gently pick up her leg 
Wow, she is nice and relaxed. So I'm able to kind of get her legs separated um, and open. Ooh. Opening her leg is, is proving a little tricky with this pinning setup because normally when you're opening their front legs, they're not in a channel. Um... think my pin is in the way. That's better. I'm not sure if she's going to open her claw for us. Oh, there we go. The more I work with her, the more she moves a little bit. So we actually might be getting closer and closer to getting her up high enough. There we go. Up high enough to pick up her. If we can get her pronotum picked up enough where her legs stop fighting me, then yes. We can open up her legs. And then... Maybe we have a praying mantis sketch day when she gets all dried up. Because then we'll be able to sketch her with her wings open. And we didn't have that ability the last time we sketched a praying mantis. Do you use just regular styrofoam or is it some special kind? Um, there is a special type of styrofoam that you use in the unit trays. So in these trays, there is special styrofoam to hold the pins so that the pins don't take on vibration. They don't shake. They're not going to get damaged. And when you put the pins in this styrofoam, they never bounce. Um, whereas sometimes in other styrofoams, you'll put it in and then it'll bounce in one direction or another. But... This styrofoam that I'm using to actually pin my specimens onto, this is just basic styrofoam. I just save it from when I get sh items shipped. Alright, so you can see if I tilt her a little bit that I have her front leg, at least her coxy and her femur pulled out. This up here is going to be her tibia. Um, and so I'm going to do the same on the other side. This is what she looks like on the other side with it all closed up. It does make us nervous to watch, but guess what? She is pretty relaxed. Most of the way. Why won't you move your little leg out? What's stopping you? There's something stopping her. She says, no, I don't want to push my ow, leg out. Oh, is this a, I think there might be a piece of styrofoam blocking her. The channel is like... There we go. Now her leg is starting to move a little bit. Oh, come on. Pick your... Open up your leg, little lady. There we go. There. 
All right, so now she is grabbing that pin from either side. So if I insert this pin from the right, just exactly where the left one is, in between the legs here, then they have a little bit of support actually in between the coxy and the, or actually this is in between the femur and the tibia. And now, we're going to open up the tibial segment so that the, we can see the tarsi. Let's see. I need more pins. Stat. Here we are. I think the corner of my styrofoam broke. I may have also used the pieces, used the pins that I was using to hold them together. Excuse me. Sorry, guys. Huh. Human, too. All right. Opening up her tibial sac. Oop, oh. She might be done. She is not going to open those segments for us today. But this is actually pretty darn cool. And so we're still going to be sketching her. Um, now you can see I gave you that whole spiel about not wanting the antenna to be way over the pin. Now our pin is way down here. Our pin is way down here. And our body and our antenna are above the level of the pin. But this is what we would call a decorative pin and not a pin that we would generally use in a scientific insect collection, right? We're not going to be doing all of this detail for something like, um, like, an, like, a, like a scientific collection, but um, for people who would really like to um, see them on a display, you know, the praying mantids are always great to talk about. Um, and this is a species that, you know, is collected in Pennsylvania, the state I'm in. So definitely something I don't mind um, pinning and then talking to people about. People will still come up to me and say, hey, that's a praying mantis. I heard that you're not supposed to kill them or that they're threatened or endangered or that if you hurt them, you're going to be fined or all of these things. And they'll ask me if it's true. And you know what's funny is I... Um, that's just another old wives' tale, but people have heard it all over the world. So, or all over at least the United States, not the world. Um, but people have heard it all over. So I guess my question to you is, um, have you ever heard that praying mantids were endangered or that the, you can be, um, or that you can be fined for attacking, ooh, for killing one or anything like that? It's really not good that my board is falling apart right exactly where the spread job happened. That doesn't make me happy. I'm going to stitch it together a little bit. Alright, so I think that is our friend, our Chinese praying mantis. Her legs are pretty open. We'll be able to look at all of the individual parts, but her tarsal segments and her tibia wouldn't open from the femur. She has like a death claw. Um, her like muscles are really locked in there. So if I knew this in the beginning, I would have worked her legs so that we could do it. But um, I didn't want to worry about like trying to force it if it was going to move the wings and all of the other things. So there she is. So 
so Deb has heard it. Um, no, of course you're not an expert. This is just something that, like, pretty much everyone has heard. And so, um, it's, it's not a true statement. Like, it's never been true. And I don't know of any species of praying mantis that were even endangered. It's just that people love them. And they don't, like, want, pe want people to injure them. And so they say those types of things. Or, I don't know. I don't know where it started. But I do know that it's, um, not... Um, actually something that happens. It's not a law. You have heard that they'll bite or sting. Well, I mean, arguably, yeah, praying mantids. Praying mantids will bite ya. Um, for sure. They will also, um... They'll also, you pi also pinch you really good. Uh, those raptorial claws, and some of them are really sharp. And so when you go to, when you go to pin them, or like when you go to hold them, if they, uh, if they fight back and they really pinch you, they can get you pretty good. All right, this is our friend, the Death's Head Sphinx Moth. Let me go ahead and change this word back because the Death's Head Sphinx Moth is what the whole day is supposed to be about. But our praying mantis was a bonus. A bonus that lasted like 30 minutes. You've always had them be nice and gentle with you. Oh, and see, that's great. Um, they'll only really go at you if they feel threatened or if, they, if they're trying to defend themselves. So if they're scared or if they feel threatened, they're going to really go after you and pinch you. But if you are very gentle with them, they generally are not going to hurt you. So that's really awesome. They know that you're kind. So, you may say, where is the, where's the death's head? It doesn't look like it's even there. Um, this moth is, um, this death's head sphinx moth is, uh, relaxed, and therefore it's also, um, it's also kind of wet, essentially. It's been in an environment where it's high humidity, so to keep these legs relaxed. But it also keeps them kind of moist. And so, um, as... But it's also a, a liquid that evaporates very quickly. So over the course of the time of us spreading this moth, you're going to see it go from the super dark color into the light color, and then into the color that... Um, it'll finally end up being, which is a pretty light color, more like these ones. But those ones are backwards because of the way, because of the way it is. <laughs> All right, so um, these moths, I am not putting a pin directly through because they are meant for a display. So all that I'm doing is I put two pins that cross over the abdomen. I put one right in front of the head so it doesn't slide up and down um, when I pull the wings. And then I put one on either side of the head so she doesn't turn. And then I just grab this front wing and I pull it up. Um... I'm also going to be using this line so that to help us with where it should be. So that looks about good. Um, and I'm going to take just one of these really small pieces of paper. Where did my pins go? There they are. All right, I'm just going to take one of these small pieces of paper, and I'm just going to go really quickly over the tip here. Oh, that's two pins. Oh no, you're supposed to hold it. Maybe it's not in the, maybe it's not strong enough. I was hoping to just be able to put a little one on. We're gonna try. Ah, 
Yeah, right. That held it a little bit better. Um, and then we're going to be grabbing this hind wing up. And I'm also going to be putting a smaller piece over the hind wing. And then I want to make sure that it's at the right level. We'll put a bigger piece over it shortly. Plus, I know that a lot of you like to see these. Oh, whoopsies. over to my pinning cabinet and pick up some more pins. Oopsies. Punch the camera. There we go. So it looks like our front wing is all the way across. I forgot to take that label off for you. We've got the hind wing. We're going to pull this front wing up. guys it just works better this way I tried to do it with the smaller papers but as it turns out it was I don't I think I'm gonna have to redo those ones just because of the way that it's holding the pins like holding the wings I don't think it's gonna work very well Alright, so we've got this larger piece of paper on this side. This is generally how I do it because it's going to be able to hold both the front and the hind wing. So I'm just going to take this hind wing, I'm going to pull it up so that it's about even. I can put my finger on the pin on the wing when I'm using this paper to protect it because the paper is not going to um, knock any of the scales off of the wings and this is a special type of paper this is an I don't just use wax paper although wax paper does generally work I use um, glassine envelopes that's spelled G-L-A-S-S-I-N-E. Oh, no. Did it drop a little bit? I think it dropped a little bit. Yeah. We're going to have to pull that left wing up a little bit. You see it dropped? I didn't put enough um, pins along that top layer, and... When I shifted it for the uh, hind wing, the front wing fell a little bit. The other thing that'll help is making sure that I've got a pin on either side of the point of the wing down here so that it has um, a little bit more stability and then one at the base right about here. Hopefully that will stay a little bit better. And you see our hind wing is, is falling slightly because it's like, oh, that front wing was loose. Now I want to fall too. I want to be part of the party. That's what this hind wing is saying. So we're going to fix him too. There is no party to be had here. It's serious business. That's probably a lie. We have all the parties. 
All right, so we have that the both wings are spread fairly nicely. Um, you can see that I have all of these, um, all of this kind of open wing here, and those wing areas, you'll be able to tell that it's not right. So what I'm gonna do is this first piece should be able to hold the wings. So I'm gonna take it off and turn it so that it's like this. And then I'll just go ahead and add one more piece over there to this tip so that it's all covered. Um, but I'll make sure that I will use, I'll use one piece in the future. Let's see, I've got a bunch of strips. <laughs> Looking for, all right, I'll just cut a piece. So these are envelopes that originally just started off as um, moth envelopes, but then I cut them into pieces, and so that's how I get pieces of the envelopes. Um, a lot of times when you receive, if you purchase like, um, if you purchase a moth in the in the mail or something, if somebody ships you a moth, um, regularly they'll come in an envelope. That's just how they come. So you can cut up the envelope you receive the moth in and it should be enough to get you going. All right, so here's a couple of things. Now we've got those wings taken care of. I no longer want these pins crossed on top of the abdomen. I actually want them pinned underneath the abdomen because the abdomen is so incredibly heavy that um, it's more likely to slouch than it is to, you know, pick up randomly. So instead of putting them above, you put it below to support that heavy body weight. Um, I normally tuck these hind legs in, but admittedly, I kind of like that. And they look even right now. So to make sure that they stay nice and even, I'm actually just going to put a pin on the inside of each leg. I'm not going to move them or anything because I think that they're in a fairly natural position. Um, why not? Now these two pins on the sides of the head, I'm going to take out because I'm going to use them to spread the antenna of our moth like this. So I can just take them, kind of slide them in between the head and the, th um, between the antenna and the head and pull those antenna forward like that. And admittedly, I like it when I like it when the angle of the antenna are kind of matched or a little above the angle of the wing. So this is just a little bit above the angle of the wing, and I think that's pretty happy. Pretty it looks pretty good. I like watching you work and how careful you are. Yes, it's super important to be careful when you're spreading insects and it takes a lot of concentration and focus. So sometimes I'm surprised that I'm able to talk all the way through it. Um, and if I have random time periods where I just like randomly stop speaking or like end in the middle of a sentence, it's because whatever I was thinking and trying to focus on just cut off my conversation mode, you know? I'm not sure if that ever happens to you guys, but totally happens to me. Oh, Susan, you retracted it. Let's see. The abdomen is all dark. Will the orange markings show up as it dries? Yes. Over the course of time, those, this, um, when this moth dries, it's going to become that bright orange color. Um, it just needs a little bit of time. So maybe after we're done um, pinning the second one, you'll see it dry on this one. Um, you're already seeing a little bit of coloration to show on the top, but um, that whole darkness is just because the specimen was wet. Um, I think that this specimen up here on the top is the darkest specimen that I've had so far. Everyone else is pretty bright. That one's pretty dark. That one is already dry, so that one, um, it's not going to get any brighter. And this, you see, is completely black, but over the course of time, the skull will appear. I promise you. 
And she's just so dark because she is nice and wet, essentially. She's relaxed. So her muscles are, um, they're, uh... Her muscles are easier to work with than when they're wet and so you essentially you put them in what we call a relaxation chamber and it's a, a chamber with super high humidity generally you use something that evaporates quickly like rubbing alcohol or um, ethanol um, and then you let them sit in that high humidity container without any airflow um, until they uh, until they're you know all the way they're kind of stay wet all the way through um that keeps the muscles good and then what you do is um and then after that let's see yeah you can pull them out and you can spread them and you can move them any way you want um sometimes when you're when you're relaxing insects if they're not all the way relaxed um You'll end up with issues where you go to move a leg and the leg and it gets just like stuck. Like you've got a muscle that's kind of fighting against you rather than moving with you. Um, I'm going to go and get my... I think I have to go and get my container of pins. I'm just double checking to make sure I don't have any right here, but I don't. Um, so I'm going to go and grab my container of pins really quick and I will be right back. humidity that it like loosens your muscles because obviously I know saunas are a thing but I, I I thought that it was all about um I thought that it was all about kind of sweating out impurities but I guess if it was all about just sweating it out then it might not have um the humidity it might it might just have heat So, you're going to laugh at me. I have a good number of full-size pins left, but a lot of my full-size pins, I know what size they are. And regularly, I like to kind of pin with pins that I'm not sure what they are, or kind of like a mixture of a bunch of pins. Um, because you like to know that at least with the pins you're putting through your insects, they are like a size, I like a size two, for instance. And so I've got a lot of containers that are full of size two pins, but I don't really want to use them to spread with. Um, yeah. And then I've got this wonderful, uh, let's see. This pin. Like, uh, for, uh quilting right a quilting pin so I went over to my drawer and I got a mishmash of random pens so it'll be fun to see what happens but I don't like this one we're just gonna pull those antenna up really quick there we go So they use steam, don't they? Yes, um, saunas do use steam. So they'd use heat and humidity. But I was wondering if, like, 
what what effect the humidity has on human muscles i was wondering if the the humidity keeps our muscles like relaxed or if the sauna was all about sweating it out rather than like relaxing your muscles i'm not really sure that's what i was wondering wondering out loud Alrighty, so I've got two more little squares of paper that should work to cover the entire set of wings. I'm going to start by, well actually our legs are kind of holding our body up a little bit, so I'm going to kind of squeeze our legs together a little, ooh, not that much. We're going to squeeze the legs together just a little bit so that she gets tucked down here into this channel. I'm actually just going to use this guy right here. There we go. Um, Because I want her legs to be happy. And her body to be straight. That's all I want. Won't you do that for me? She says, uh, no. Why would I want to be kind to you? Come on, baby. Yep, nope, she just uh, pulled her leg all the way back out. We're just going to tuck you back in there then. There we go. All right, we're going to leave her like that. And I think she's trying to scooch up on us too. Look at her. She's just being, she's just being a meanie. And she has the pink pen on the the pink pin on her. We need a name for her. She's a pain. All right. So, um, let me make sure I've got this line right. Right about there. And now I'm going to take our piece of paper and I'm going to put it over it and then transfer the pressure from the forceps into my fingers so that I can hold her down and pin her wings. I'm going to just really gently kind of push her body into the, um, into this channel because she's lifting pretty heavily. Actually, I'm just going to take her take pins and cross them over her body because I don't want her to lift too heavily and she's lifting because that that left leg refuses to go down into the channel so it's picking up her entire body but um we can always fix things right so we took um some pins and we crossed them over the top of her body to kind of help push her down a little bit that is a nail. I'm not going to use nails. Someone, I think, so I think I, I, I received some of these pins just as like leftover pins from a museum at some point. And somebody has mixed the nails in with the um, pins. And I wonder if there was somebody who was actually using like, I wonder if they were actually using like nails to pin their insects or what that was for um i sometimes felt like using like a really thick nail like this would have been good for something like um when you're working with spreading boards that are actually made of wood it kind of hurts to spend all day pushing the pins into wood eventually that hurts your fingers <clears throat> All right, we've got the hind wing pulled up. But it didn't open like I wanted it to, so I'm going to bump it a little bit. There we go. And the thing with spreading them is that... Oops. No! Darn it. Uh, I messed up the previous one. I bumped one of the pins. Um, mm, I don't remember what I was saying.
So I got into the habit with the last one with pulling some pins out of previous specimens because the other three on this board are actually dry. Oh no, look what I did. I left so much room in between these two that I don't think I'm going to have enough room for another one. I was supposed to fit six on this board, but I'm not going to move it now because she already has one wing spread. That would take too long. Alright, so I have her wing all open. Oh, oopsies. Oh, no. Don't drop her like that. I took a couple of her scales off doing that. I accidentally slipped. Try not to do that. There we go. Alright, measure the front wings to each other. Put them on a line. That's pretty good. Get our pins in. I did it. I opened a box of two hundred new pins. Or a container, 200 new pins. Whoopsies. There we go. Oh, come on, pin. Stop falling. All right, so we've got our front wing taken care of. I'm gonna go ahead and pull our hind wing up. Come on, friend. All right, so after I get the hind wing up, oops. I was going to say I release it a little bit so that I can um, put it where it belongs, but it released a whole lot of it. So a lot of times when you're pulling the wing up, when you're using forceps, you might grab like a larger portion of the wing than you want and it might fold, but a lot of times it unfolds by itself. But I do have a dissecting probe just in case it unfolds too much. Come on, front. It just, it fell too far again. Oh, this hind wing is not liking me. No. I'm just going to leave her there wherever she sits, even if it's not all the way perfect. The little imperfections are how you, oh, not like that. The little imperfections, the little ones, are how you know that, that it was done by hand, right? So, like, sometimes it's all right because it was done by a person. There was time and energy put into doing it, even if it's a little bit. There we go. See, I I can't believe she her her wingtip keeps falling down like that. I'm. It's not like I'm taking any of the pressure off. I don't know why she keeps falling. It's just that every time I pull her up, this hind wing curls a little bit. There we go. We're gonna. Yes, leave her like exactly, oh, like it was. This 
is a feeling like a game of Mario where you just can't beat the level and you die at the same place every time. That's how I feel right now. We're gonna get her done. Finally, we did it. Alright, yay! I admire your persistence. I would have stuck a pin in it by now. Honestly, I consider doing it. I consider just putting a pin right through the wing because I'm afraid that it's still gonna fall now that it's even even now that it's like surrounded by pins, I am afraid that it's gonna fall. But if it falls now, it's not my fault. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that a lot. The, um, <clears throat> collections take, collections take a good amount of time to, um, to build. <laughs> you gotta, you know, the whole collecting part, and then, and then the pinning part, and, you know, admittedly, then going back and labeling all of the specimens also takes a while. Um, typing up, up all the labels, uh, and then actually you have to print insect labels with a, um, you have to print them with a laser jet, not an ink jet. And I don't own a laser jet, so I have to go and get them, get my pr labels printed. And, uh, you type labels at like a three and a half or a four point font, so they are incredibly tiny. And the guy is always like, are you sure you can read this? And I'm like, yep, that's all I need. Just a little label, a half an inch long, you know? Um, but I print like hundreds of, I try and print a whole sheet of labels at a time. So this one is actually going to be really pretty. Look at it. It's already kind of light in certain places. And I was kind of hoping that if I scooch it really far back, like really close to this last specimen, that hopefully I can fit it on the board. <laughs> because this specimen I just didn't, there's just a whole half an inch here. Whoopsies. But this board was meant for six, so we're going to try. Can you put a dot of glue on it? Unfortunately, no. Um, you can't put... Oh, it dropped. I'm going to leave it. It is what it is. I might move it. Nope, I'm not. Yep. Mm, too much work. Yeah, so a lot of times when you're talking about pinning a variety of the other insects, um, not as... They generally don't take as long individually as a sphinx moth would take. Oh, we didn't do the fi final steps on this lady because I got so tired of messing with her that I didn't fix finish her. So we're going to take the pins from the on top of her abdomen and cross them underneath her abdomen to lift that up nicely. However you leave these specimens is how they will be for the rest of eternity. For the rest of the life of the specimen, however you leave it, that's what it's going to look like. Um, so that is sometimes, like, scary, like, to think about, because you're like, now I've got to make it perfect. Um, but it's a true statement, you know. I've seen specimens from the late 1800s. Um, I worked with a specimen from 1880, and I was like, this is so cool. But, um, even specimens like that, somebody spread them. 200 years ago and they still look the same way they did back then and I think that that's one of the really cool things about collections in general tell them don't worry I have a microscope 
Um, can you put a dot of glue on it? All right, so I just read that question and I laughed, but I know that it's a real question, so I will answer you. Um, unfortunately, no, you can't put a dot of glue on it. I mean, maybe I guess you could in theory. Ugh. Um, so the issue with, here's what I'm thinking. I'll take you through my thought process rather than giving you a straight yes or no answer. Because theoretically... You could use a dot of glue um, on it, all right? You end up with two different issues if you use glue. The first issue is that a lot of glue is going to change, oop, a lot of glue is going to change the color of the specimen or of the cells because as the glue dries, it makes the specimen look kind of wet. I don't know how to describe it. It makes the specimen look kind of darker than it was. So you'll have one kind of spot on your specimen that's darker than the rest of it. So that's not really great. Um, and then the other thing that will happen is, give me a minute, I'm trying to get this lady down into this groove, and she is fighting me hard. All right. Um, the other thing that would happen is if you put a dot of glue on the specimen and you glued it to the styrofoam, it's now glued to the styrofoam. So when you try and take it off of the styrofoam, you're going to end up ripping the wing where the glue was. Now, I have... Admittedly, I have used glue on an insect specimen in the past. That was my first Luna moth ever. I was so excited to have it, and right when I got it, and I was opening and spreading its wings, one of the tails fell off. Oh, it was the worst experience. I was so nervous for it. And so I had to glue the tail back on. But the issue with that was I couldn't just go ahead and glue the tail on. Not You can't do that while they're wet. You have to wait for the specimen to dry. And I was actively pinning it when it lost its tail. So what I ended up doing was spreading the moth normally um, and then putting the tail aside and putting a piece of paper over the tail too because you want the tail to also, even though it's separated from the wing, you want it to flatten when it's dry. So I just put it on the spreading board and I just laid it there. And then after the moth was all the way dry, I picked up the specimen from the spreading board a little bit and I made myself like essentially two little pinning tables here I'll show you because this is actually this is actually a kind of cool technique um, and you do this with cardstock but I don't have cardstock at the ready so I'm just gonna show you with one of these pieces of paper what you do is you'll take a piece of cardstock And you make yourself this like little table with the pins where instead of pushing it all the way to the ground, you just kind of half put it in. And so now you've got like this, uh, this like little table essentially. And then you do two of them. You do a table here and then a table here. And then you put the glue in between the tables. So you have the one, the top of the wing here and the bottom of the wing here. And then the glue just sits on the wings because you don't want the glue touching anything else other than the wings. Because if you do, it will be stuck to the wings forever. Wings are very fragile when they're dried. So um, your two options are actually gluing a small piece of the like, you could probably cut an itty-bitty piece, like an itty-itty-bitty piece, and use it as, like, a splint and put glue on both sides and then just leave it on the wing. But I didn't want a piece on my wing because it was my first Luna Moth ever and I wanted the specimen to look good. So I ended up just, like, doing that. And the specimen was so beautiful. I was so excited.
I understand. Not a lot of people know about Sisyphus's sister, Trishyphus. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yep. <laughs> uh, luckily, that hasn't happened to me yet. I have been able to finish my most of my spread jobs. But I'm not happy with how high... Oh, I pinned it through my finger. Ow. Okay. I've never put the pin through my finger before. That was an experience. Alrighty, I've got two pieces of paper. Oh, three. That's three pieces of paper. I've got two pieces of paper. I'm gonna pull this wing up. Hopefully it's gonna block out that... Oops. Hopefully it's gonna block out that front leg that's been driving me up a wall. Looks like it will, mostly. I'm wondering if it's just not going to be low enough on the board. Alright, we are going to do this. I'm going to put the pins here in the styrofoam on the edges and like on the front edges and then for just a moment I'm also going to put the some pins along the bottom I'm gonna have to take the ones on the bottom out because the hind wing has to come up but I'm gonna make us a cardstock table for this wing because that's too much of the wing left on left over that it that's not going to make me happy. So I did have a pretty big piece of cardstock here, so I'm just going to cut it into a piece. I'm going to slide it in there. Probably take this pin out and this pin out, but hold the wing. And then I'm going to slide this piece of cardstock essentially underneath the wing. And then I'm going to pin it through both the, um, uh, wax paper and the cardstock to kind of hold it in place. Like that. That's how you expand a, um, and that's how you expand a, uh, uh, a spreading board just a little bit. You've pinned through your finger. Ouch! Yeah! And it's also just like, it's also surprising. It's like, oh, I didn't expect to put that pin all the way through my finger. Whoops! You will sanitize your finger afterwards, won't you? Um, I will admit that's not something I've ever considered, but you're probably right. I probably should go and sanitize my fingers because, um, I'm not exactly sure the last time that pin was used or what it was used on, so I do get that. Um, I'm obviously, I'm going to wash my hands at some point, but, um... I haven't ever really worried about pins poking me. But now I might. So we've got that front left wing taken care of. Um, we are going to be pulling up this right wing now. We're going to be doing the same thing on this side. I just want to make sure... Oops, I... Oops. I want to make sure that... 
That Lang Wing was straight. Oh, come on, friend. It's running away from my forceps. There we go. <laughs> Dope! Oh, that's not high enough. Actually, it might be. This uh, right side, it doesn't go over the spreading board as much as the left side does. And I wonder... My body... My body must be crooked a little bit. Noble entomologist. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. are falling way more than the left wings are. You know what I'm going to do this time? Instead of trying to fix this right wing over and over and over again, I'm just going to let the left wing fall to match it. I thought I would. That looks better. I just think that it's so obvious when the hind wings aren't the same, especially in these guys, because of this angle here where the front wing meets the hind wing. Oh, yay. All right, let's pull these antenna up. Oh, and your antenna aren't going to be straight? You're really going to do that to me, little friend? The antenna are really the tricky part in I find a lot of insects because they are so many they have so many joints that they have so many places that they can bend. And so every now and again you need to use a lot of pins on just one antenna because it wants to bend in so many weird places. But here's the thing, the more pins you use to make sure that the antenna is looking right, um, the more chances that you have that you make the antenna look really weird because you have like pushed it in a direction it wouldn't naturally have gone. But it's like, come on friend, just be straight for me. Just be straight with me, man. Ah, right. The right antenna was nice to us. The left antenna was a little bit tricky. Now, we're going to take these ones that are on the top. We're going to lift this abdomen up a little bit and put them under the bottom. Now, this one is already 
getting pretty orange is already kind of getting its coloration. I'm going to kind of lay down some of these skull hairs because it looks like a couple of them have stood up a little bit. This one seems pretty wet looking still, and I'm worried that that is body grease and not, um, and not it being wet. Because sometimes moths will have kind of like excess grease in their body and it turns their abdomens dark. Um, so tomorrow when I come down here, I'm hoping that that looks like a normal death's head. <clears throat> How does Justin Schmidt rate pin through finger on his scale? Ha ha ha. I love that. Um, unfortunately... It doesn't have a rating because he only rates bees, wasps, and ants. He doesn't even, like, scorpions aren't on the list. Tarantulas are not on the list. Um, even other stinging insects. Let's see. Is there any other stinging insects that I can think of? Nope. I can only think of bees, wasps, and ants that sting. But... Anyway, that is a three Death's Head Sphinx Moths. My question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is do you want to keep going? Because I have a whole other board, and I have a whole bunch more specimens that are, that are relaxed. We could keep going. I also know that it is after 11, so we've been doing this for, for um, a little bit more than an hour. So I just wanted to check in with everyone and see how we're all feeling. Um, this board is not prepped for death's heads yet, so I have to grab my lighter, and we are going to fix it. Let's see, where's my lighter? It got buried somewhere on my desk under all of these glassine envelopes, I think. Let's see. <laughs> oh, there it is. It was hidden behind my bug glue. Didn't you say wheel bugs have venom? Yes, wheel bugs are assassin bugs, and assassin bugs do have venom. Um, they use their venom with their mouth parts, so it's not a stinger in the back. It's an in um, it's an injection from their mouth parts. But I guess you could. It's it is a venom. Um, it's just not a sting. And so that's exactly that's actually a really good example of a um, that's a really good example of an insect that has venom that is not a bee, a wasp, or an ant. All right, bye, Susan. It was nice hanging out with you today. Um, Deb asks, does it have an odor? Um, does what have an odor? Because of, because of how fire works, I'm not able to do the, um, to do the lighter on the table. Um, I have, I have to kind of pick this up to show you. And as you saw a minute ago, my, um, my forward-facing camera decided to disconnect. So let me see if I can reconnect it really quick. Oh, the abdomen that is dry that may be oil. Right. Um... It does not, <clears throat> it does not have an odor. Um, so, uh, it's not going to have an odor because it's not, um, it's not rot. Uh, the abdomen isn't rotting. It's just, it has a little bit of that, um, it's not rotting, it just has body grease on it. It's a little bit different. Tarantulas, if you see a tarantula that's that color after it's pinned, it's because its body is rotting, and that smells horrible. 
Uh, right. So when I when I fire uh, when I fire a, a styrofoam board, a lot of times that first line I'll make with a heat knife. Um, I think I've done that with you before. Um, it's also well, actually, it's a it's an interchangeable one. This attachment I actually have on right now is a soldering iron because it's the one that seems to work well with my. Um, so this is like the soldering iron tip of my of my heat knife, and um, it works really well for getting that line started. But then, um, with these ladies, they have huge abdomens. So I've been taking the boards. I'll stand the fire up like this, and I just. All right, I, I, I'm not going to actually do it because I can't see it away from me, but I want to show you. I just run the, um, I run the lighter down the channel, and then I let the, um, I run the lighter down the channel, and I let the fire open up the, uh, open up the channel just a little bit. And it's funny because that channel that the lighter makes is pretty much the exact size that I need for these, um, for these sphinx moths. Some of their abdomens are like a half inch wide. It's insane. <clears throat> oh, um, sorry about the delay sometimes. I feel like every now and again, the delay between uh, my video and your comments is like even greater than normal. And so if I, feel, if I sound like I'm delayed it's number one probably because i um i was so focused on spreading that i may not have noticed but the other thing is that it's possible that there is some type of lag in the youtube system that makes me that makes you nervous yeah i mean my mom says that my mom says that I, when i'm working with styrofoam i should be doing it in a well ventilated area and I know, I know, I know I should be. Um, it's just such a small amount that I don't feel like it's going to have too much of a bad negative effect. I'm done. It's more, <laughs> admittedly, whew, it's more sometimes, sometimes the other chemicals that I work with with insects are more dangerous. Like, um, I have paradichlorobenzene in my collection. It's, um... The, uh, it's the chemical compound kind of the way we shorten it. We call it PDB for short. Um, and it's a chemical compound that exists in mothballs. Um, but, you know, it's been shown to be carcinogenous. Car carcinogen. It's been shown to be a carcinogen, which is no good. But um, it also keeps the bugs out of my collection, which is so incredibly important. So... Um, you know, we just try not to breathe it in. All right. So I'm actually, I know that I can use three. I know that this spreading board holds six, but I like to start from the bottom and work my way up. So I'm actually going to see how long my board is. Just a rough estimate. Um, my board is about, like, eh, we're going to say 14 and a half inches. So I'm going to start, let's see, half of 14 is 7, and I said 14 and a half, so half of a half is a quarter, so 7 and a quarter. If this is 6, then you've got 1 and a quarter. This is about half C's. This is about half C's. There, I've got a little bit of line to work with now. And so I will start the abdomen, the bottom abdomen, right here on this line. Alrighty, now I'm pulling out uh, our death's head. So let's see what she looks like. Alright, that's what she looks like. We lost a leg, ladies and gentlemen. Going in the leg bag. I'm curious how many legs I'm going to end up with by the end of this. Because it's not like I'm purposely knocking off the legs, but, you know, every now and again, um, a specimen loses their leg. And especially with death heads, you, um, you don't see the leg. A lot of times you're not looking at the bottom. So 
I have not been gluing the legs back on. I've just been putting them in this nice little glassine envelope. And I figure maybe I'll like slide mount them or look at them under the microscope or use them in like an illustration something or another. I'm not sure. Oh no, friend. I forgot. I need to put the pin in front of her before I try and do that. So front pin first because she'll start sliding around all over the place if I don't do that. And then I do these cross, especially if I'm trying to kind of push her down into the down into the board a little bit. There we go. And now two pins on either side of her head. I go through so many pins. It's like 10 pins per side of the wing. Like each one of these specimens has about 25 pins in it. So that's also why it takes so long. It's like um, I'm not only I'm not only making sure that the, that the body parts are exactly where they need to be, but also it's just the pure number of pins that you're using that have to be placed well. There. I wanted her a little bit further in the channel, so I used my forceps to push her down gently, and then I took those pins at the front, and I put them in more at angles, so they're, they'll hold her down into the... Wow! Look at her wings! Her wings are a little nicer, just to start. You know what would be awesome? If my spreading boards, if I put, um, if I put, like, checkerboards on my spreading boards, like, um, like, guidelines... That just occurred to me, and I feel like that is a genius idea. I might be doing that shortly. Oops. Terry, what are you doing? Terry wanted to be seen. He said, hey, what about me? You haven't seen me in a little while. So next week in a lot of my student classes, I'm going to be, um, the next week in a lot of my student classes, the insect of the week are stoneflies. So I, um, I've been thinking that I might go out and do a little bit of aquatic collecting because I have adult stoneflies, but I also, because we're going to be talking stoneflies and we're going to be talking the immature stage too, I kind of want to have a stonefly um, nymph to show the students and if I have a nymph to show the students I might as well show you ladies and gentlemen too so I admittedly I was thinking that I would um, I was thinking that that's what I would do is I would go out aquatic collecting in the next week or so and um, or in the next well I guess when is my when is my for that class start I think that class starts on, I think that class starts on Tuesday. So between now and Tuesday, I think I'm going to be aquatic collecting. And I need to go somewhere nice because as you may know, if, if you've collected aquatics and you know a little bit about like macro invertebrates, um, like aquatic macros, um, Oops, I bent that pin. Um, then you know that stoneflies are an indicator of healthy streams and a healthy water body because they're sensitive to pollution and they're sensitive to low oxygen quality in the water. And so when you have stoneflies, you know that you have both healthy water that is not very heavily polluted and... Um, uh, highly oxygenated, so likely to have um, fish and stuff. So stoneflies are a really great thing to see in the water. And you do see them. Um, you do see them. Let's see. You see them all year round in the water bodies. Uh, a lot of times you're more likely to find them around in the rivers or what we call riffles. 
Um, that's spelled R-I-F-F-L-E-S. Um, riffles in the stream is where the water breaks over a rock and you have like little um, like little whitewater rapids essentially in the water. Um, that's where the water is turning and putting oxygen into the water and it has the highest oxygen content and is also likely where you will find stoneflies. Do you see how nice that hind wing was? It just lifted. It stayed. I'm going to put some pins in it. My goodness. If every spread job was like that, we would be going so much faster. All right, lift abdomen. When I lifted this abdomen, the hind right wing decided to defy me. It shifted enough of the body muscles that it moved. I didn't put enough in. Now, regularly, normally, I would just put a pin through the wing so that it wasn't falling like this. But I did have a special request not to use pins because of, you know, the micro holes or whatever. So... It takes a little bit longer, but they do look nicer. I only had three pins on the other side, and it stayed. All right, now I'm going to pull these two that were holding the body down, and I'm going to use them to pull these antenna up. harder to pin? That's a wonderful question. The answer is yes and. Um, the nymphs are harder to pin. Yes. And you don't, and, and that's the reason why you don't pin the nymphs. Um, aquatic insects like the nymphs that are only found in water do not do well on pins. Um, in terrestrial environments they just don't do well so what you do is you collect them into alcohol and you leave them in alcohol and spiders and stoneflies are alcohol specimens so I have um, I'm saying alcohol but I have um, I'll show you uh, this is 70% uh, denatured ethanol from Carolina Biological Supply, and this is what I use to, um, and this is what I use to not only dispatch some of my insects, I'll just bring a vial or two of ethanol, and that's how I'll kill some of my insects like the beetles and the wasps, but um, you also leave specimens like spiders um, and aquatic specimens in ethanol. Now, a lot of people even leave the adults in ethanol, but, um, the adults are flying around. They are, you know, they're not fully aquatic. They are terrestrial. And, um, I like having some specimens pinned. So I pin my stoneflies and people judge me for it sometimes. They're like, wow, I've never seen pinned stoneflies. I've only seen them in ethanol. And I'm like, well, you know, they have wings and I like to see them out of the water. But when you leave the specimens in ethanol, they also stay a little mobile. So when you pull them out and you're working with them in the ethanol, um, you can still like move the body parts around, which is kind of cool. That one, that moth went so well that I kind of want to try another one. I have, who oh, I got a good whiff of that one on accident. 
That was strong. Sometimes, to make life really interesting, when I'm pinning insects, especially sometimes these older insects, and especially insects with larger bodies, I will light an incense stick. I used to leave my insect stick, incense sticks on the, um, the left side of my desk. But normally the smoke goes off to the right and it started going in front of the camera and it was making me look like a ghost. Like it was making me look all smoky. So I had to move it to the other side. Yay, let's make it smell even better in here. Okay, grab this. That's fine. Alrighty, so we're going to go just above this sphinx moth and we're gonna put a we're gonna put a friend here. Now I believe I'm gonna have to cut up another envelope because I think that was my last two pieces. I'm gonna practically stack, try and like get them really close to one another because, ooh, that is a, a excitement waiting to happen. I just dropped a pin on the ground and I know that bounced somewhere weird. I don't know if I'm gonna find it. Excitement waiting to happen. What I need are one of those, like, really big magnets. <laughs> and then I would be able to kind of scan my carpet for dropped pins. That would be smart. I'm just kind of on a roll, so I figured we would just go ahead. Especially because that last one was like really easy going. Just spread open, place the paper, and keep going. Um, and if I can get on a roll with some of these, I really have, I have a good number of them left to spread. And we're halfway through the month. Um, so I might be spreading these guys just solo a little bit too. I hate doing it alone though because I know that you guys like to be with me when I do things like this and it's a cool thing to watch, you know, so I was hoping to just get all 50 of them done. 40? 40 of them. I have 40 of these to spread. I've already given the person the first 15. I have seven more done. This is going to be number eight. So that is 15 plus eight is... 23 so we are actually over halfway there that's awesome get a large magnet to find it yes that would be great now I just need to get one Oh, hey, where do you think you're going? She jumped right out of that. She jumped right out of the, out of the, uh, what do we call the divot in the center of the, 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 uh, the spreading board, the channel. She jumped out of the channel. There we go. Push her down a little bit. Put those angles in so that she stays down. Yeah. Now, I'll add these ones on the abdomen that will hold her down into the channel, hopefully. Hmm. 
There, there, she went into the channel. She was fighting me a little bit there, but we finally got her there. So I'm going to go ahead and take the rest of these pins out of my container. And this is actually a good place to stop after her because I'm about to finish that other 100 pins that I opened up a little bit ago. Remember when I said, all right, 100 pins. Um, I just took the rest of them and smashed them on the board. So there's only a handful of them left. So let's finish them. Alrighty. One of you ladies had, well, I don't remember who said it, but one of you had it right when you said that it actually hurts pretty good when you poke yourself with these. Your fingers are so sensitive, you know? That other time when I actually went through my finger, I went through in one of those places where, you know, if you've ever done it as a kid, you can kind of put a pin through your finger, like just through the upper layer um, before, uh, so that it doesn't hurt. And so that's what I did previously when I was pinning. I accidentally pinned it through just like the very, very edge of my skin so that it didn't hurt at all. But I've gotten poked a couple of times today that hurt pretty good. What's also fun is um, is taking these off of the uh, off of the the moths. Um, the thing with these is if I take them off the moths, they don't have pins through the center of their bodies. So I don't know exactly what I would do even if I did take them off. I might take the paper off, get my pins back, and then just leave them on the boards. I haven't decided exactly what the plan is. I realized that I have essentially invisible guidelines that I can use as part of my, like, as part of my, um, streaming software, so I don't actually have to turn on that red line to make sure that it's even anymore, but if you wanted to see the red line as I'm going through, let me know, and I will go ahead and turn it back on as I'm going. So we've got our wings all spread. I'm going to get our abdomen lifted. Take these out. Put it underneath. Just pull it up a little bit. That's just because it's going to drag. So get that abdomen up. 
so that it doesn't fall when it dries. And then I do have these two pins that I was using to hold our moth down, but now that we've got those taken care of, I can use them to pull her antenna up. Normally I don't put the pin actually through this wax paper, but you know what? It seems to be working, so we're going to do it again. Yay! All right, that is Sphinx Moth number... Oh, that's number five for tonight. Automotive Supply has them with long handles. Ooh, that would be so good. I think that that's honestly a safety precaution that I should definitely have around. Because it does, it hurts to step on them. <laughs> it does, it does. There's a part of me that thinks this board might be too short to add another one up here. It looks like... This specimen take, takes up about three inches. This specimen takes up about two and a half inches. And we have about two inches left on the board. So I think that, excuse me, I think that if I, need, if I wanted to put another one here, I would have had to move everybody down maybe a half an inch. Maybe I should have aimed for the wings at the center line rather than the end of the body. But I don't know. Maybe we'll be able to fit three on the bottom. We'll see. Just not today. It is almost midnight where I am, and I don't want to get tired while I'm spreading these guys because we don't want to hurt any of the wings. So I super, 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 super appreciate all of you hanging out today. Um watching and joining along while we are while we spread death's head sphinx moths i'm glad to get all of the uh collection management questions if you have anything like that um if you are um if you are making your own collection and you would like some help or some guidelines i can always give you those if you're curious um Today was Saturday. Every Saturday we spread Death's Head Sphinx Moths. Tomorrow we'll be drawing something. We'll be sketching a bug from my microscope. I'm not sure what exactly just yet, but I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Um, on Mondays, we do, um, we've been doing Monday meet and greets with my animals. And this Monday we're going upstairs. We're going to go and see the chinchillas. Now, the chinchillas are in a different room, and they do, there isn't a green screen there. So uh, we're probably just going to be kind of hanging out on the floor. Maybe I'll use, like, the, the, the door as a background. Um, but we're going to hang out with the chinchillas, and we're going to feed them snacks, and we're going to talk about them a little bit, and that's going to be lots of fun. Um... Let's see, Tuesday we're doing tarot again. Um, we've been doing tarot and symbology every Tuesday. Um, Wednesdays and Fridays we do line drawings. Um, Wednesday and Fridays we do ink line drawings because we're also kind of celebrating Inktober, you know, twice a month. That's why we have a little K there in our logo too. So we are live every day, 10 p.m. Eastern, except Sundays. So tomorrow, if you join us, we are 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific. All right. Um, we're going to go here. All right. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I super appreciate it. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching me spread the Death's Head Sphinx Moths. Um... It is the same insect that we are spreading over and over again, but you know what? It, um, 
I always think that they are also unique individuals, too. So um, as we're watching them and interacting with them, we get to see at least the variation within the species. It's kind of fun. Um, and they're very Halloween-themed, so might as well spread Death's Head Sphinx Moths all the month, the entire month of October. Um, I also teach classes on OutSchool. This is where I teach students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, and I have students from all over the world. I'm even teaching a handful of ESL students, or students who English is their second language. But you know what is so cool is that any of the scientific names for the families in... Um, any of the scientific names for the families, they, it's the same word for them. So I can give them the scientific names of our insects, and they have the ability to look them up in their own language, which is so cool. And so I've been, um, been teaching many students over in um, China, and I've got students in Canada and Hawaii and all over the place. So if you, have, you know a student who is young and loves bugs and wants to meet other bug lovers, we have... I have student bug lovers from all over the world, which is kind of wonderful. And they bring all types of really cool bugs. Like my students from China, they get to show me all of the like really big beetles and stuff, and it's kind of awesome. And um, like unique insects from all over the place because they just find them in their backyards. So that's fun, and I'm only a little bit jealous. Can you tell? Now, um, over there is... Uh, is uh, our reminder to go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That is not going to be a button, but there is a button below. Um, there is also a link below to my PayPal account. So if the QR code doesn't work on your phone, you can just go ahead and open the description box below, and there's a link down there. That is where you can donate a couple dollars to me. Um, you know, I use that I, I use that money for our pin collection, like um, pinning materials and collection materials and, you know, um, all types of buggy related equipment. I am going to be buying, um, I'm going to be buying new pens shortly. I haven't done that yet, but I plan to. So, um, that's, uh, that's where that goes and I'd super appreciate it. You know, every dollar counts and it helps me to continue to curate my collection, but also to share my love of insects with you. Now, right about there, you can see my tag. It is Insectopia 2015. Now, if you're looking for me at Insectopia at Facebook or Instagram and you can't find me, that's because you missed the year that we started. I, um, I started, Insectopia was established in 2015. That's when my first YouTube videos started coming out. And um, we've been on and off over the years because I uh, I took a I took a short break to uh, run the education department of a museum, but I am back and having more fun than ever. So um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, and I look forward to seeing everybody on another day of Invert Tober. Have a wonderful week. Stay buggy.